All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second quarter 2021 OWASP Omaha chapter meeting. Uh, I'm Michael Bourne, one of the chapter leaders here, and we've got a great speaker today who's going to be presenting on the OWASP Top 10. His name is Mr. Aaron Clark, though if you're in the DC 402 OWASP or InfoSec circuit, you may know him as Crypto Jones. Um, and uh, I've, I've known Aaron uh, for at least a year or two from DC 402 and, and other InfoSec conferences and like Colonel Con and uh, Wild West Hack and Fest and, and things like that. Um, so Aaron's going to present today and give us a, an introduction to the OWASP Top 10. I'm going to keep everybody muted and, and we'll try to save some time at the end for any questions. Uh, Aaron, go ahead and take it away. Okay. So can you see the uh, slideshow? Man. Yes, we can. All right. So obviously, uh, welcome to the OWASP Omaha second quarter meeting of 2021. We are doing the introduction to the OWASP top 10. Uh, real quick, I always do the intro slide. Who am I? Um, Aaron Clark. Uh, you could be laughing at the handle. Uh, I made it in the 90s in the dial-up BBS days. Uh, crypto is supposed to be for cryptography. Obviously, some people today uh would argue with me um jones was indiana jones because i was a kid and i wanted to be him uh, now i am a graduate student at both rit and uh, western governors use of western governors university um if you ever need anything i am crypto jones at owasp.org uh, and i have linkedin twitter and github where the actual slide deck is which um, michael sent a link to so all right, so first uh, uh, first is the intro slide to the speaker. Second is the bluff, or military, we call it the bottom line up front. So this presentation is on the 2017 version of uh, uh, OWASP Top 10. And what the OWASP Top 10 is, is uh, the top 10 most uh, influential application security risks and um, these are agreed upon by, uh, it's a, well, it's a collective product of feedback from uh, security experts around the world. Um, the 2021 version is coming soon, possibly the summer, probably the fall. Um, it has a brand new website with new uh, CSS and everything that is OWASPtop10.org. And uh, when I was making this presentation, I just did a little screen cap of the um, of the little project status. And so like all the, the surveys complete, all the data is normalized. Now they're writing the documentation and reviewing what I'm assuming is that documentation. So stand by for that. Um, uh, so because this is the 17 version, you'll see these like A1 2017. Uh, that's how the, um, the, the format of the um, the risks are um, enumerated. So uh, A1 is injection. And so that they decided that uh, all the security experts around the world collectively decided this is the most, uh, I don't know, uh, the most uh, serious uh, uh, um, security risk out there. So uh, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this XKD slide. Uh, woman names her uh, uh, son with some SQL injection characters and it uh, deletes the school's records. I, always funny to me. Um, and it is, like I said, is the number one risk. So yes, SQL injection, but not limited to just SQL. So you have command injection, regex injection. Um, there's all kinds of uh, different injections you can um, uh, run against a system. Now, uh, how to keep uh, that from happening um, is you need to sanitize your input. So on the client side, that's input validation. And then on the server side, it's parameterization. So uh, you can see I have sanitize your inputs three times because uh, I'm really trying to get the point across that it's super, super important uh, that you don't take in raw you know, SQL or raw anything that the user is giving you because uh, uh, first first rule of like IT is don't trust users, right? Uh, probably security too, but anywho. 
Um, so uh, uh, OWASP has two different um, cheat sheets, or excuse me, cheat sheets um, for uh, um, mitigating the uh, injection. We got the input validation uh, and the parameterization. So um, these cheat sheets are like really good uh, um, guidance on how to uh, mitigate um, the the vulnerabilities or the um, the risks um, associated with uh, a certain number, right? Okay, so that brings us to number two, uh, broken authentication and session management. So um, auth authentication, um, unlike authorization, is just establishing the identity of a person using a system. And so, uh, when an, authentic when an authentication session happens, um, it's the, the process stores uh, something in an area of memory or on a file that tracks the status of who or what is using the system. So when you on multi-user systems, uh, you have to jump back and forth uh, between these different um, users or entities, and that's what we call session management. Now, on our web applications, a um, uh, really common uh, technique is uh, Java web tokens um, or JSON web tokens, not Java, sorry. Um, and then uh, for like stateful systems, we have like Active Directory um, tokens and what have you. So um, computers uh, managing this ineffectively or just straight up uh, not, not uh, checking for uh, the correct um, auth, um, the correct authorization, or excuse me, the correct auth authentication credentials um, is a problem. Uh, for example, I bought a, a new door and I got one of the, I got like the cheapest Chinese digital lock I could find because as a security guy, I knew that was going to be the best um, way. So installed it on my door um, and uh, got the batteries uh, installed, uh, programmed it. So uh, I was like, uh, I told my son, hey, I'll give you $20 if you can hack this and have it open for you. And he was like, all right. So he put in some random number, uh, hit unlock, and it unlocked the door. Uh, and that is because the authentication mechanism, the, the padlock, uh, is broken. It wasn't working correctly. It let someone who didn't have access, namely my son, into my house. So that's why all my food is eaten. And to mitigate broken authentication session management, um, one, we need to store our passwords correctly, right? Uh, I think there was some survey where if you uh, paid a freelancer to write like a password thing, uh, like 43% of the time they're storing them in plain text. So no, you can't store them in plain text and even just hashing them, MD5 hash, uh, SHA2, that's, it's not safe. Um, and even complex hashes alone uh, are only safe. We really need hash, salts, uh, and iterations. Uh, a combination of them is what, um, in your algorithms, are what uh, actually make your um, your tables safe. Because these these tables can uh, be stolen by people, and that's how you know all these database this is like the Ashley Madison database. People's passwords were, yeah, it was a big deal. So anyway, to do it right, uh, we need uh, Bcrypt, which has a time cost, Scrypt, which has a time and memory cost, um, or Argon2i, which is a time cost, memory cost, and a degree of parallelism. So um, obviously, you want to make the work factor and memory cost uh, as high and intensive as possible, because regardless of what you think in your application, you're never going to go back and refactor this system. Uh, it's going to be this way uh, in 20 years when they go to uh, find a new one. So. Uh, that is that. Um, obviously, uh, and I think uh, Dave Kennedy tweeted this yesterday or the day before. He's like, hey, you need to turn on MFA uh, or multi factor authentication for everything. Um, just turn it on everything. This is the only way we're going to stay safe because passwords alone are just not cutting it anymore. Speaking of passwords, um, password policies have actually uh, changed from NST. Um, 800-64B 
they changed it up. You, they used to, they used to want you to have like special characters and uppercase and what have you. Uh, that's all gone. Um, basically, they, the longer the password, the better. Um, they actually recommend using past phrases now, like correct horse battery staple. Um, also, mitigations for this is um, like those Ashley Madison uh, username password dumps. Um, you need to block those. There's third party services that uh, you have APIs you can pull the breach data from. And when one of the, uh, one of your users shows up on that list, you just force them to uh, change their password. And uh, lastly, uh, the mitigations, um, there's a new uh, SP document, SP 800-63-3. It's a digital auth guidelines. And it says that you should allow all your printable ASCII characters and even Unicode characters too, like emojis. So you could have like three different emojis as your uh, password plus whatever. So uh, at least eight characters, 16 is better, but they want you to allow up to 64. And uh, yeah, I was talking about earlier, the crazy special characters, uh, don't do that. And don't use password uh, or security hints um, because those are easily guessed or uh, stolen through social engineering, what have you. Obviously, you want to throttle or mitigate brute force attempts. Um, if you can, uh, some, some systems you cannot, uh, but whatever. Um, all right, so the guidance for the broken authentication session management is actually, uh, there's a cheat sheet for it, um, OWASP auth authentication cheat sheet, and there's the link uh, for that. Um, so sensitive data exposure is uh, number three on the list. Um, so what data is sensitive? Well, all of its data, you, you shouldn't be exposing anything regardless of what you think its classification type is. Um, only authenticated users should be able to see uh, data and they should be, they should be um, containerized into what data they have access to. Um, things that, uh, can mitigate this, always encrypt, never, ever, 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 ever use HTTP. Always encrypt, always use TLS, um, HTS, TS, can't remember what that stands for. Uh, uh, and you want to encrypt before the, the message are actually sent. Um, so JSON web encryption is a way to do that. And then you want to also sign, uh, so you have your uh, authenticity. Um, with the JSON web signature properties. Um, you wanna manage your keys and certificates properly. We don't wanna just store them in, in a GitHub repo. Um, we wanna ver verify the TLS certificates before we use them. We don't want you know a thread to go out and verify them then uh, also use them at the same time. Uh, yeah, never, ever, ever, ever roll your own crypto. Uh, I don't care if you have a PhD in advanced mathematics uh, don't do it. Um, use audited, standard, verified libraries. Uh, Libsodium, that's great, great uh, go-to for .NET developers. Uh, Tink, uh, Tink is from Google, and it ties in with a lot of the most uh, se um, secrets management solutions, identity management, um, I think Psychotic, maybe not, I can't remember. But anyway, um, what you want to do is you want to isolate these cryptographic processes from other services. Uh, the best thing you can do is put them on their uh, own VM or even better, uh, if possible, a physical server um, that has physical security. And um, so for uh, A3, these are, uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, guidance for it. There's the cryptographic storage cheat sheet, TLS cipher uh, string cheat sheet, certificate pinning cheat sheet, um, the .NET security cheat sheet uh, for A6 is sensitive data exposure. Um, there's REST security cheat sheet. And then the, uh, oh yeah, this is what it is. Uh, strict transport security, uh, the HSTS um, cheat sheet. So number four, XXE. This is uh, kind of my favorite because um, I'm a little old. And when I, uh, when I was going to school, there was no JSON. We started with uh, XML. Um, so I remember being uh, deep into this in undergrad. Um, 
basically the XML parsers that we have suck when it comes to security. Um, there is XXC attacks, um, and they basically just uh, try to take down the XML service uh, by um, either exfilling data or just making the XML processing so computationally intensive that um, it's almost like a denial of service attack. Um, this is one example of uh, where you would pull out the um, the uh, etc password file from a Linux box or Unix box, whatever, um, through the XML parser, which I thought was kind of scary. Um, and then uh, there's also something called the billion laughs attack, which is a, 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 an example of exp exponential entity expansion. Um, and it basically uses uh, multiple levels of nested queries and each entity refers to another one uh, several times. And the final little, uh, the final uh, entity definition contains a string, uh, but the exponential expansion in, results in like several gigabytes, sometimes several hundred gigs of text. And it consumes a lot of memory and CPU time. Uh, one of the, the mitigations for that is to um, uh, set debt limits on your recursing, recursion, um, disable your DTT inclusion um, so that uh, it has to pull from uh, either external or uh, or just uh, disable to find them altogether. Um, you definitely set memory limits for your parsers. Um, I'm assuming that's possible. Um, I haven't actually used a parser in probably like five years uh, for XML. Um, in Java, um, Jim Manicode, uh, who we'll get to later, he says to just disable all of the external entity references uh, just to be safe because uh, he was a Java, Java programmer. Then we have um, we have a cheat sheet, XML entity prevention cheat sheet, and then we also have uh, guidance on XML uh, XXC processing. So um, those are definitely worth uh, taking a read of. Um, five, uh, number five is broken access control. So uh, for example, let's say um, I have a web application that shows the user their profile and this is the URL they get to. Um, if the user is sneaky and he changes this 50 to 51, hits enter, and it brings him to some other user's profile and seeing uh, sensitive information to other users, that means my access control is broken. I shouldn't be allowing uh, that user to uh, see other people's stuff just by changing a uh, field in the URL. Um, uh, one thing that will fix this is attribute-based access controls. Um, there's a, I had no idea what this meant uh, when I was preparing for this um, uh, presentation. So uh, I included the Wikipedia um, and um, they're basically, uh, they use ands, uh, basically like this and that, um, uh, to come up with like a final uh, policy example. Um, one thing that I thought was cool in ADS stuff, they're called tags. I had seen the tags feature in my um, ATF or AWS panel, um, but I just never knew what the he heck the tags were for. So um, when I wrote this slide, I was like, hey, that's cool. That's what those are. Um, there is a access control cheat sheet from o uh, OWASP. And then there also is a, uh, a, a NIST guide to the AVAC definition and consideration. So uh, if you are designing um, these types of systems, that's at least worth a, a look-see. So A6 is such a huge topic uh, because security misconfigurations can literally be anything from you know layer three switches to application firewalls. And just one you know backslash in the wrong place can you know, allow your system to um, be compromised. Um, so the, the problem is these types of things can't be found with, uh, you know, burp suite scans, uh, or automated scanning. You, you have to manually sit and verify everything, which is so time consuming. Uh, so uh, that's probably why uh, this got on the list at all. Um, just so many of them. Uh, as for guidance, um, there's there's uh, there's lots of uh, different guidelines depending on your pr uh, product you're talking about. Uh, one of my favorites is the uh, SE Linux user 
an administrator's guide. Um, when I was uh, early in my career, I was a Linux system administrator. And the first thing I did when um, I'd stand up new boxes is disable SE Linux uh, because it, uh, the users would always complain that they couldn't, uh, even even like miss it mode, they couldn't use uh, their applications and what have you. So uh, I was literally creating A6s across, uh, you know, uh, um, my employer's network, uh, who's now a major cloud provider, which is kind of scary. Um, but anywho, I definitely uh, find the product that uh, you should probably have a, a guide for every product you have and go through them uh, during your annual audit or, you know, whatever schedule you set for your security stuff. And um, uh, for the security, you really want to design it uh, up front uh, via tri uh, the access control cheat sheet um, is one of these uh, documents on the uh, cheat sheet site. And then obviously uh, NIST has their own um, ABAC documentation. So um, that brings us to seven and seven, I think is one of the most, uh, I think I think it's one of the most misunderstood, um, uh, one of the most misunderstood um, uh, risks uh, because when I see cross-site scripting, I'm thinking, oh, hey, I'm doing something to like multiple machines, but um, th that's that's not necessarily true. Um, it, it could be just multiple parties. So, uh, for example, this right here, um, I don't believe this works anymore, but uh, you can definitely try it. Um, if you uh, throw it into your uh, Google search bar um, on some browsers uh, that aren't protected, um, it'll pop up a little a JavaScript alert. And um, that's uh, kind of cool. Uh, but there's um, there's reflected, which is uh, sent to a victim by attack an attacker. And then so like let's say I send you a malicious URL with uh, you know uh, maybe a link to something that um, you know sh sh gives me your cookie or what have you. Um, and, or what I would do is I throw this uh, throw this uh, URL inside a a site or uh, throw it in a database table so that when uh, the site pushes it up, then it takes the cookie and uh, sends it somewhere else. That's uh, There's actually an excesses attack uh, called cookie hook, or excuse me, cookie theft, where um, it pushes to a different site. Maybe this is where the cross-site scripting thing comes from. Sure, but uh, there are cheat sheets for this. Uh, there's cross-site scripting cheat sheet. There's DOM-based. Um, cross-site scripting prevention sheet. And then there's also XXS, excuse me, XSS filter evasion cheat sheet. And one, uh, so some of the ways you can bypass these XXS, XSS filters is by like um, putting all your characters in, uh, oh, what, what do you call that? Um, basically encoding your characters uh, so that um, your whole script is encoded, but when uh, the computer reads it, uh, it looks like normal JavaScript. So there's there's ways to get around like these web mm -hmm. application firewalls that are uh, specifically going for this. So um, number eight is insecure deserialization. So um, uh, as computer programmers, we need our applications to talk to other applications. Um, and uh, we do this through the process called serialization. So whether it's a .NET or Java, um, or Python objects, um, those get uh, serialized into what we call JSON. And uh, those JSON objects then get sent over the internet uh, and um, captured by another system. And that other system uh, deserializes them and, uh, from like a binary stream or a file and puts it back into some type of object in memory. Uh, so the problem is um, that Again, you're trusting you're trusting data uh, from other um, other places. So um, there are attacks uh, that um, you know uh, are um, using these uh, insecure deserialization processes. Um, obviously, uh, you need to keep your parsers up to date and only use um, XML or JSON. Um, there's a reason XML is going away. Uh, only a, hopefully only a 
a small percent of uh, companies are using that in their systems. Uh, but there's a lot of legacy code, so who knows? And uh, again, uh, not like the no uh, a zero trust architecture, but definitely uh, just be cognizant of uh, who you're allowing to hook into your APIs. Um, there's one cheat sheet under your serialization. It's, again, definitely worth a look. Um, issue nine. So this is a big one because um, it, it, there, there's always, always CVs coming out with, uh, you know, um, flaws in different libraries and what have you. Uh, so um, I, guess I would say good security practitioners would make sure their um, system administrators or whomever are updating these. Um, uh, yeah, update your dependencies. Uh, there's uh, third party things that do this. Uh, retire.js, retire.net, and a SNCC. There's SYNC. I forget how you pronounce it, but um, the SYNC is cool because it's free up to a point. Like yeah, there's a free tier. I, I pointed at my I pointed at my GitHub repos, and then it automatically created a pull request to update one of my libraries. So all I had to do is like approve and merge, and then my uh, under the pull request and boom, my stuff was updated. So that's sick was really cool. And I know it's a professional product and uh, like a commercial product, but uh, it was still cool to see it happen on my uh, stupid like hello world applications on GitHub. Um, there is uh, guidance for vulnerability dependency, um, but there's also lots and lots and lots of uh, third party tools. This is one of those uh, problems to solve that I think a lot of companies have made their, uh, you know, their business. Um, so it's it's definitely it's definitely worth worth taking a look at at least a couple of them. Uh, and finally, uh, insufficient uh, logging and monitoring. Uh, I like to talk about monitoring first. Uh, do not ignore alerts. Um, there is probably for every for every uh, you know hacked pipeline. There's probably you know a story about some one ignoring alerts that are, you know, coming to, you know, Splunk or wherever the heck uh, the, uh, the data is being ingested. Um, insufficient logging, right? Uh, you, you really need to log all your authentication, your failures, anytime changes password, registration. Um, uh, you need to log all of that. And I say log early and often. Um, and it's good because you uh, need it for intrusion detection, forensic analysis, proof of regulatory compliance. Uh, you know, some lawyer might uh, sue your company and uh, you might win or lose the case whether or not you um, uh, have that data. Um, one thing you don't want to log, and that's uh, sensitive data. Like in the past, they, they were like, log everything, right? Well, no, because of HIPAA and um, PCI, I spelled that wrong. Um, you don't want to log, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to log your passwords or your session IDs because if someone has real-time access to the log, uh, they can go and uh, compromise other accounts uh, and what have you. Um, there is a cheat sheet for logging. Uh, so definitely read that. Um, okay, so I do wanna, for attribution, I do wanna say uh, thank you to Jim Manico. Um, he uh, met him at AppSec Cali 2019. He's one of the OWASP global leaders, and he literally did teach me everything I know about the OWASP top 10. Um, I reached out to him, and he gave me permission to uh, put his email in here um, and his website. Uh, he does give uh, he, get, he does give a lot of cool uh, classes through his uh, Manicode training site, and um, uh, he gave a, a version of this talk in this YouTube video uh, that I have linked here. So. Um, I apologize if I rushed through that, uh, super nervous, um, but uh, are there any questions? All right, I'm gonna uh, stop the recording real quick okay. and then we'll open it up uh, uh, for questions. Okay.